Good morning. Those wildfires raging in the area of Yellowstone National Park show no signs of letting up. After today, a million acres of Yellowstone will have been burned. Two towns are seriously threatened, and firefighters are bracing for an unfavorable change in the weather today. A Tuesday, September 6, 1988. From NBC News, this is Today with Bryant Gumbel and Jane Pauley. And a good Tuesday morning, everybody. Bryant is in Korea preparing for the Seoul Olympics, and David Frost is here with us all this week. In just a moment, we'll get more on the fires at the news desk. And then at 7.09, we'll go live to the fire scene to talk to what can be done to save the towns that are, as I said, very seriously threatened today. And we'll also be going uh, live to Boston and to Washington, where key advisors in the Dukakis and Bush campaigns will tell us what strategy they'll use to win the hearts and the minds of the American voter. One of the hottest young stars in the NFL will be telling us why breaking the rules is an even better road to fame than breaking up blockers. That's later when we talk to Brian Bosworth. And in our last 8.30 half hour, we'll be joined by John Cleese. John Otto Cleese of Monty Python, Faulty Towers, and now a fish called Wanda. And our question on After 8 this morning, where do you go when you are 13 years old and running away from home? Your choices are not very many and none of them good. But first, let's get started at the news desk for John Palmer this week. Here's Deborah Norville. Jane, good morning, David. First, those fires which continue to burn at Yellowstone National Park, fires that have already blackened a million acres in and around the park. And with winds expected to pick up today, firefighters are desperately working to try to save towns in the fire line. NBC News correspondent Roger O'Neill is at West Yellowstone this morning. Good morning, Roger. Good morning, Deborah. The fire bosses in Yellowstone National Park and in the surrounding towns of West Yellowstone, Cook City, and Silvergate say they're not going to concede an inch of ground today without a fight. And yet at the same time, they cannot guarantee that any of the forest fires here can be stopped. The situation is critical in Silvergate, Montana, where 19 fire breaks have been built in recent weeks and not one has held the flames back. There is one fire break left just outside of town. Uh, these are proud people. They're the crack firefighters in the nation, and they're not used to getting whipped day after day after day. The fire conditions are severe, and they haven't had uh, uh, a great deal of success in holding line that is built uh, with uh, great difficulty. Someone added a letter to the Cook City sign. 2,000 firefighters say they are ready for trench warfare with the flames before that will happen. 70 fire trucks are in the two towns, keeping everything watered down. In the resort town of West Yellowstone, a sprinkler system has been installed by volunteers, most of them Mormon farmers. The sprinklers are causing a humidity here in the forest, and that's doing more good than anything. Irrigation pipe rings three sides of the town this morning. That water could come in very handy this afternoon as a new frontal system approaches the Yellowstone area, a frontal system that is predicted to bring with it 10 to 20 mile an hour winds today and 20 to 30 mile an hour winds tomorrow. Deborah. Mm. All right, Roger O'Neill at Yellowstone, thank you. Hot weather in the west is also posing some real problems for firefighters in Southern California. Three wildfires north of Los Angeles burned thousands of acres of brushland. High winds, as well as a third day of temperatures soaring above the 100-degree mark, have made it very difficult to control those fires. Several buildings in the area have been destroyed. With the November election just nine weeks from now, George Bush and Michael Dukakis are stepping up their campaigns and their attacks on each other. Dukakis spent Labor Day addressing crowds in the Midwest, hoping to build support among middle-class voters. He charged that under the Reagan administration, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and the middle class is getting squeezed in between. The caucus continues on the road today in Illinois and Ohio. Vice President Bush continues his campaign on the West Coast in Oregon and Washington State. The Vice President spent his Labor Day working the crowds in California, a state seen as critical in the fall election. More now from NBC News correspondent Dennis Murphy. George Bush had a Disneyland send-off for Olympic athletes on their way to Korea. You're representing the country of the little guy. Sentimental words in Disneyland, harsh words later at an L.A. police picnic. Bush was cheered when he called for the death penalty and tougher judges. In San Diego, he linked Michael Dukakis with Jane Fonda and, quote, 
fuzzy liberals who care more for criminals than their victims. How gloomy he is. It was only the first day of the official fall campaign, but the Bush themes are already locked in. Be tough on national defense, be bullish on the economy, and attack Dukakis as weak on crime and national security. Those are the themes that Bush strategists think will play very well in California, the state with the most electoral votes. The Bush people regard California as a nation with four states. The state of rural, independence. The state of Bay Area, democratic. The state of Los Angeles, a toss-up. And what they bank on, the Republican heartland, Orange and San Diego counties. So it was significant that Bush came to Disneyland. Bush leads Dukakis by 32 points in surrounding Orange County, according to an L.A. Times poll. Win Southern California big, do well in rural regions, and Bush strategists say he'll carry the state. Dennis Murphy, NBC News, Anaheim, California. A sensational trial is underway this morning in Moscow where the son-in-law of the late Leonid Brezhnev is facing graft and corruption charges. If convicted, Yuri Trebonov could face the firing squad. But as Brian Hanrahan of the BBC reports, many Soviets view this trial as a case against the entire Brezhnev era. The trial in the Soviet Supreme Court is spiced with political scandal. It's widely seen as an indictment of the nepotism and corruption of the Brezhnev era. The defense lawyer complained to reporters outside that his client had been prejudged because he was Brezhnev's son-in-law. Yuri Chabanov, he protested, was a product of the system, not the creator of it. Chabanov's progress to the dock began when he married Brezhnev's daughter. He was promoted rapidly to the top of the police force and took a million dollars in bribes. While Brezhnev lived, he could count on his protection. But now the former leader is disgraced and his method of running the country exposed as a shambles. Brezhnev's name is being removed from buildings and squares. And as the trappings of his rule are stripped away, a vast network of corruption has been revealed. The Moscow court is being told that Chabanov helped cover it all up. And just as he benefited from his Brezhnev connection in the past, now he can expect to pay heavily for it, perhaps with his life. Brian Hanrahan for NBC News, Moscow. And in the first Monday night football game of the season, it was the Giants downing the Redskins last night. New York Giants came from behind to beat the defending Super Bowl champs 27 to 20. Giants were down 13 to nothing at one point. Then they scored 27 unanswered points for the win. Twelve of those points were put on the board by the Giants' defensive unit, which, as you know, was playing without the services of suspended linebacker Lawrence Taylor. Coming up on eight minutes after the hour, that's the news up to now. Jane? And thank you, Deborah Willard. Scott is here with us, and tis yes. unseasonably cool, and we are chilly, chilly. unquestionably grateful. I committed sin last night. I want to confess to the whole world. May I do that? Well, you could do it privately if you'd prefer. <laughs> no, I like to tell everybody. I'm pr at my age, I'm proud of it. No, I watched ABC last night, and I watched That's the Redskins. I was so sorry to see them lose. I know the Giant fans matter. up here are not that way at all. But anyway, better luck next time. Joe Gibbs is my guy. He looks after me, you know. You have to. I believe in nepotism, don't you? I think it's a great system. Brezhnev tried that for a while. I saw him in the <laughs> Oops. Justice of Swift in the Old yeah. West. Hey, this is great. Uh, Mountain State College in Parkersburg, West Virginia. They're watching us on Channel 15 this morning, and they are 100 years old. Happy birthday to you. We have a great picture of the student body all yelling to the Today Show, and I'm going to try to show that picture at 8.30 if you want to get your video sets. Back home again in Indiana. 44 degrees this morning, Jane. It's 52 here. Frost not be on the pumpkin The yet. Frost is not on the pumpkin. He's on the set. He's right over there right now trying to get the other eye open. <laughs> he loves these morning hours. I can see that. I'll, he went in and made up the makeup lady. I mean, that's what you call showbiz. Mount Washington, 25 this morning. Temperatures are very chilly. They're not record breakers or anything like that, but it's just so nice and pleasant to have this nice chill in the air. I'll tell you what there is, uh, uh, Mr. Frost, there's a frost warning, the first one of the season up in Minnesota and Wisconsin today. Hibbing, Minnesota, that's good for your enunciation. Hibbing, Minnesota, is about 35 degrees this morning, maybe 32 degrees. Delightfully mild throughout the Ohio and Tennessee valleys. Look for heavy rain in Florida and South Georgia. As a matter of fact, we're only calling for the possibility of delays in Orlando, Jacksonville, almost all the Florida airports because of the heavy rain. Also scattered delays up around Seattle because of fog this morning. The bad news is heat continues in the west. It's awful, except along the coast. L.A. gets a break. It'll be 90 today instead of 103. That's wonderful. Here's what's happening in your world this morning. Good morning, everyone. We'll have clear skies till about 11 o'clock this morning. Then lots of fair weather clouds popping up in the sky this afternoon. High readings 65 to 70 degrees with a pleasant westerly wind. 
Ellen Iman of Vero Beach, Florida is 105 years old today. A British lady came over many years ago. She remembers a little girl having tea and dancing at Covent Gardens. And Lucy Goff of Sealy, Texas. That's near Posturpedic, Texas. She's 103. And Paulie Knighton of Shreveport, Louisiana is 100. 710. And here's Shane. Thank you, Willard. And on Close Up this morning, those fires raging in the West. Nearly a million acres have been blackened in and around Yellowstone National Park alone. And changing winds expected today will continue to do more damage to the surrounding communities. Silvergate, Montana, may be heading for devastation. Most of the residents have been evacuated. And with us, an, an update for us this morning is David Liebersbach. He is the incident commander in Silvergate. And I don't envy you your job this morning, sir. How does it look right now? Well, it's kind of cool right now, but uh, the potential for today and tomorrow looks pretty bad for us. We have a, about a 25% chance of success of holding the fire out of uh, these two communities. Uh, what, uh, what's working against you? The weather? The wind? The wind. Primarily the wind. We are expecting a frontal passage which should bring 20 to 30, maybe possibly 35 mile an hour winds through here for the next three days, starting uh, about noon today. If that wind comes, can you stop the fire? We have a possibility of it. Yes, we may be able to, but it's not any, anywhere near 100% sure that we can. What's your strategy? We have, lit a back, uh, we have a backfire between us and the main fire. Hopefully that backfire will suck into the main fire as it comes toward us and eliminate the fuels between the communities of Silvergate, and the Silvergate Cook area and the main fire. The problem will be with the high winds is possibility of the main fire spotting across our backfire and starting fires in and around these communities. Uh, if that happens, we'll attempt to suppress those fires, but with the high winds we have, it'll be uh, marginal that we'll be able to contain those spot fires should they occur. Meanwhile, moving around the state to West Yellowstone, Montana, Bob Barbie is with us, the superintendent of Yellowstone National Park. And, uh, well, I guess it's not a good morning, but good morning anyway. Good to have you with us. Uh, Thank you, Jane. Good morning to you. I, I am told that uh, sometime today you probably will lose your millionth acre of Yellowstone Park to this fire. Can you put that in any kind of perspective for me? How much is a million acres of, of park land? Well, it's just hard to imagine how much a million acres is. Now, it's not just in Yellowstone Park, Jane. Uh, it's also uh, in the forests that surround the park, the National Forest. But uh, it's an absolutely uh, uh, an immense, uh, immense area. Old Faithful is precariously close to the fire. How close and, 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 and how much a chance that Old Faithful could be involved? Well, you just heard Dave a moment ago talk about Silvergate. Uh, Old Faithful is much the same situation. Uh, a lot of structural units are in there. Uh, the fire is about four miles from Old Faithful. So if we do get those predicted winds, uh, uh, we could have some problems there. But uh, I think we have a good chance. Well, he uh, put, he put his odds at a kind of gloomy 25% in the Silvergate area. H what kind of odds would you give you, your firefighters for Old Faithful? Well, I, I think all these people are just doing a stellar job, uh, Jane, and uh, the folks at Old Faithful there, that are there, uh, I think, uh, probably have a, a, little, a lot better chance uh, uh, to, do, uh, to do some good things uh, to save those wonderful old structures than perhaps uh, that Dave is facing up at Silvergate in Cook City. Joining us from Washington this morning is Dale Robertson, still in a hot seat, though he may be far from the scene of the fire. He's the chief of the U.S. Forest Service, and good morning. Good morning. There are a lot of people in the area, residents in particular, who are angry with you. They say the parks and the forest people have used them and their homes as a fire line. What do you say to them? Well, we're doing the best job we know how to do to uh, protect uh, those uh, communities around Yellowstone. In fact, that is our priority, and we've pulled a lot of people away from the fire line, and we have them in those communities uh, doing the best job we know how to do to protect them from the fire. Well, if, if they were with me, I think they might say, but you waited too late to do it. In hindsight, and this has been a remarkable summer for hindsight, were they right? Maybe should the fires have been addressed more seriously early in July? Well, this you have to understand we're in the worst fire situation we've had in recorded history in the Yellowstone area. And most of those fires we have taken direct action uh, to try to put them out as soon as possible. Now, we do have some fires back in July that uh, we did not uh, put all, everything we had to suppress those fires at the time. And uh, in retrospect, uh, <laughs> we should have done more. I suppose. Would at this point, would more money and more manpower make the difference, or is the situation so hot and so dry that it really is a matter of, of luck or bad luck? 
Well, it's just a very bad situation. The Park Service and the Forest Service find themselves in a very difficult situation in the national park and wilderness areas surrounding the national parks on the national forest. These are areas that have been set aside uh, uh, and are intended to be preserved over time and nature uh, does its work out there and these forests have to be renewed and we've already had a significant amount of mountain pine beetle that's killed trees these are old unhealthy dying forest uh, that uh, sooner or later nature will renew and well, nature does it through bugs and fires there's your silver lining certainly dale robertson thank you and uh, uh, bob barbie thank you for being with us and out there on the front line david Liebersbach. good luck today We'll be back in a moment. Uh, this is Today on NBC. Well, it may seem that uh, Campaign 88 has been going full throttle for some time now, maybe two years. But today, in fact, marks the traditional first day of the fall campaign season. And to see where things stand right now, we've invited Congressman Tony Quello, Democratic Majority Whip, whose political skills are highly regarded, to our Washington Bureau this morning, and New Hampshire Governor and longtime Bush friend and supporter John Sununu, who's at our Philadelphia affiliate, KYW-TV. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning, David. How are you today? Very well indeed. May I begin by trying to summarize all the papers this weekend and ask you, if I may first, uh, Congressman, I mean, if this was a boxing match, which at times it seems to resemble, uh, I guess the papers are saying that at the moment, in fact, that uh, the Bush campaign is slightly ahead on points. Would you agree with that? Well, I think they're but one point ahead. Uh, after eight years as Vice President uh, and Governor Dukakis just on the national scene, we're very happy about that. So you're, you're content? Very content. Uh, we have you always predicted, feel, we always predicted this would be a close race, and we think it is a close race, uh, but we're in there, and uh, this is going to be very competitive, and we're very, very happy. And you don't feel stalled? No, I don't. I think that what we're in, this, we've been in the preseason, uh, as you indicated, we're now into the regular season. This is it. Uh, we have to uh, go for the final gun now, and we're gone, and it looks good. We're very competitive all over the country, very, very happy with the way things are headed right now. Are you very happy too, Governor? Are you even happier? Are you surprised the Congressman's happy? Yeah, I'm surprised. I, I didn't hear a very ringing enthusiasm in his comments. We're very comfortable. We think that now that we're in the season where the American public will take the time to look at the difference between philosophy and programs and agenda, uh, we're going to feel that, we, we feel that the American public is going to make a strong, positive decision for George Bush and Dan Quayle in November. Which do you think is the most important state for you? Well, I think we, we look at a whole host of states, but the interesting thing is is that uh, what the Democrats had laid out as an agenda, a Texas agenda, certainly seems to be uh, moving against them. We see strong movement in states like Florida and California that are key states. Uh, all the numbers are moving in the right direction. Massachusetts the other day, the polls showed the vice president even with Michael Dukakis and Michael Dukakis' own state, so the numbers are going well across the country. Okay, we can't go through all the states, so we'll, we'll give the congressman a chance. Which is the most crucial state for you, Congressman? Well, David, uh, we think we're competitive all over the country. Obviously, California and Texas are critical states. Uh, con going into this race, uh, the Bush people expected to win uh, uh, Texas big. Uh, we're even uh, in California. That has been a state that the last five presidential elections has gone Republican. We're ahead. Uh, we feel very, very good. We're into this season now where the American family has to decide who's going to help me retain my job, who's going to help me pay my mortgages, who's going to help me pay the, the health care costs for right. my family. And this is Michael Dukakis' playing field. We're going to do very well. Right. One last question and a brief, uh, brief response. Do you both think it's going to be close? Everyone says it's going to be close because it's unpredictable. Or do you both think you're going to win easy? Well, the rich and the poor have decided where they're going. It's the middle class that has to make a decision now. It's going to be very close. Michael Dukakis is going to win this election. Governor, is it going to be close? Well, I think the middle class knows that the jobs that have been created, the 17.5 million jobs have been Republican creation. They're going to go with the winner that has given them the job. They're going to go Republican. Well, thank you both very much indeed, and uh, we thank you for joining us this morning. And uh, there you are. You now know the result. Both sides are going to win. We'll be back in a moment, but first, this is Today on NBC.
Watching David Frost do that interview about the American presidential campaign makes me wonder what your perspective is from... Britain. Well, I'm fascinated by it because, in fact, uh, in England, of course, people stand for office. Here they run for office, so it's more vigorous here. That's why it excites me so much. It's hard to keep your eye on them. Yes, it is. In the last That's campaign great. in England, one guy said, the Socialist Party is stirring up apathy all over this country. A neat trick. <laughs> Station break.